Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. For each week, we speak with brands, icons, innovators, and trailblazers within the fly fishing industry, exploring both the successes and failures they've encountered along the way to become who they are today. But first, if you have not yet subscribed to the podcast or joined our email list, please do so by going to the Fly Fisher Insider Podcast.com, or you can also find us on Instagram at Fly Fisher Insider Podcast. Now let's begin. Welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Today, our guest is Roger Henchcliffe. Roger is the, uh, the brains, the man, the, the operation here behind the Steelhead Manifesto, a longtime publication, blogs, everything Steelhead. And he is one of our features here on Steelhead Month on the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. Here today to tell us more about everything that he's got going on is Roger. Roger, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. So, um, really get really good uh, talking with you. I know we talked a little bit off air there briefly, and I just can't wait to jump in on all the stuff that you gotta that you want to mention. But before we talk about all the good stuff here, let's talk about how you kind of you know, which is also good, um, how you got into uh, fly fishing. How you how you yeah. Well, what happened when I was young, my parents had divorced when I was um, two years old, and um, my mom had moved us to a river, um, which uh, I lived maybe two blocks from. And so as a young boy back then, you know, 40 years ago, uh, you, <laughs> you could actually just let your kid get on a bicycle and go down to the river and fish. And um, that's kind of how it all started. Uh, I've been fishing for 40 years and, um, you know, just uh, fell in love with it. I learned to fish for many different species. Uh, my home river, which is the Huron River, it had at that time it had uh, walleye and smallmouth bass and uh, panfish and pike. Uh, we'd get a silver bass run, uh, and then I discovered carp. Um, cause I love the carp fish. A lot of people don't know I'm a multi-species angler. I just love any kind of tug, mm -hmm. so to speak. But, um, down the street, we had a neighbor kid and I became friends with his name was Dale and his family would go up North in Michigan and we would camp out and we would go salmon fishing. And, um, I discovered salmon fishing at the age of 10 and my uncle had a place on, uh, the pier Marquette, which I fished there as well. And, uh, that's when I went bananas over the, the silver species of fish, but, um, it, it all started about 40 years ago. <laughs> so, and uh, I've been a fishing, fishing maniac ever since. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I, I think it's safe to say you're definitely a fishing maniac. So, so forty years ago, you got the the salmon bug. We're gonna call it. And uh, since mm -hmm. then, where like you you how did you get into where you're at now? Like writing about it, blogging about it, creating what you've created. Like, and to the level that you're at, where you know, I know. We, again, we talked about fair. I'm gonna bring it up now. Like you've traveled so many places. You just mentioned there was like two places that you haven't traveled. So, like where mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Where um. Like, when did all that transpire? When did you realize, hey, like, this is, like, legit? Yeah, well, what had happened was um, years ago, uh, it, it for the steelhead portion, I didn't get crazy about steelhead until I was about 19. And back then, you know, I did uh, what a lot of people did. I threw spinners for them. I bottom bounced uh, bait for them or pulled plugs. Um, and, you know, I started off doing that and then I got into the fly fishing game for them and, you know, and, you know, I still do many different types of fishing for many species in many different ways. But, um, that's when I fell in love with the steelhead. And ever since then, you know, I, 
just wanted to uh, learn and uh, grow as much as I could as an angler because I, I'll, I'll just say this in, in other interviews or other writings, I've said it before, um, I don't profess to know everything. I just have an opinion on how to catch these fish. So does everybody else, but it's a lifelong journey as an angler. You're, you're never going to know everything. You know, it's just a lifelong quest. And I think when you wrap all of that up into the species of steelhead, that's kind of what drew me uh, to that fish. And there's no question I like to catch other fish, you know, like I like to strip streamers for smallmouth bass. You know, that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, uh, I would have to say I got bit by the steelhead bug and um, pretty much... uh, just fell in love with them. And so years later, fast forward, I had joined a fishing club and, um, that was great. Um, you know, I belong to the Michigan fly fishing club and some other clubs. I'm actually, uh, on the cold water steering committee, uh, here in Michigan. Um, you know, so I was really plugged into a lot of different outlets and, um, So what had happened was one of the fishing clubs asked me, they said, man, you know, uh, you seem to catch a lot of fish. Would you mind coming to the club and giving a presentation on what you do or how you do it or whatever? Give us some tips and tricks. And uh, I said, sure. So I did that. And apparently I I must have did something right because within two weeks I had two other club chapters calling me saying, Hey, can you come talk about fishing? And so that's kind of how my fishing uh, career started. I mean, I never like set out to do this. It just kind of turned out this way. And then my kids, which are now grown and, you know, in college and all of that, the, they're the ones that talked me into getting on social media uh, because you know, at the end of the day, I'm an old guy (laughs) and you know, that technology piece, um, wasn't really something that I was involved with. And so I had started uh, a blog called steelhead manifesto and the blog was very successful. And, uh, you know, I started doing some writing for different magazines uh, around the country. Um, you know, I've had articles published around the world actually. And, um, I, you know, just, it just took off from there. And I thought it was so cool because social media does get a bad rap, you know, on certain arenas about certain things. But one thing about social media is a great, it's a great way to communicate. But what I love about it the most is it brings people together. Well said. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, um, how I kind of got started, you know, I just gave a a talk and a seminar and, you know, I got into the fly fishing and when I did fly fishing, I did, um, a lot of indicator fishing. Um, you know, that's just kind of how I fished for steelhead. And then about 17 years ago, I think it was 2003, it could have been 2004. Um, another friend of mine, his name is Jeff Liskay. Oh yeah, we do. Um, you know Jeff. Oh, he's a super, yeah. super human being. That guy, I love Jeff. He's an awesome guy. Um, my local fly shop. Um, he came there uh, to do some uh, classes on how to spay cast. So I went down there and got uh, a lesson from Jeff and uh, another gentleman named Will Turk. I don't know if you know Will, but. Um, those two uh, yeah. kind of taught me how to cast, and so there you go. You're a lucky and so, guy, Roger. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, truly am. I'm truly blessed by God. I, I will publicly say that um, I'm truly blessed by God, and I appreciate all the great things that have come. And um, you know, the Lama Glass deal. Um, I, I don't know if you're aware. I do work for a company so, called yeah, Lama Glass. Let's let's jump in on that. Let's let's, uh, and then I'm going to jump back to the Steelhead Manifesto a bit more. But let's jump in on mm-hmm. the Lama Glass really quickly. Like you are designing rods for Lama Glass, and many mm-hmm. many you know steelheaders if, if are aware of that the the company Lama Glass. Um, it's a the West Coast brand, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yes. yeah, walk walk us through. Like, did they approach you and say, "Hey, like your knowledge is fantastic"? Yeah. Like, how did that transpire? Yeah, so what it 
Yeah. So what had happened was, um, uh, I think it was 2017. Um, I got a call from Lama Glass and they were interested in having me pro staff, you know, be an ambassador for the brand. And I was already very familiar with Lama Glass. For your listeners that may not know, Lama Glass is the godfather of today's fishing rods. So uh, most people don't know that. It's, they've been in business for 71 years. And, um, you know, Gary Loomis started at Lama Glass. Um, Sage came from Lama Glass. And uh, it's just a great company. And, and so I started off just representing them. And then the um, president of the company had asked me, he goes, well, you know, you're from the Great Lakes and uh, we have a great offering here in the Pacific Northwest, but uh, do you think we need any different products for the Great Lakes? And I said, oh my God, yes. And so they had me work on the first rod project, um, which was actually a center pin rod. Um, and uh, I worked on that one for them. And then from there, uh, it just blossomed. I, I The last time I knew, I'd been involved in over 29 different uh, rod projects with Lama Glass, uh, including walleye even uh, the new walleye chicken rods. So it's been really great. And, you know, uh, dreams do come true, right? They do. And uh, I don't know how else to say it, but, yeah, it's a great, a great company. It's been around a long time. And uh, they have the largest mandrel catalog of any rod company in the world. The history that is there is just unbelievable. So, and that helps too, mm -hmm. right? Oh, it helps yeah. give you a great start. Absolutely. So, they, they got good yeah, and we have some new fly rods coming too, by the oh, way. I can't tell you oh. much about them yet, unfortunately. You know but I was, I was just leading into that question, Roger. I was just about to say, okay, so <laughs> like any fly rods coming from Lama Glass or what's going on with that? I mean, it's, it's the next, next yeah. level. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's more to come from Lama Glass. Unfortunately, um, like our um, design process this year, because, you know, the company, the factory is in Woodland, Washington. So whenever uh, I've worked on some projects, you know, I got to get on a plane and fly out there. Well, due to COVID and all the craziness that's uh, going on in our world, you know, the traveling aspect, um, you know, so a lot of things have gotten pushed behind. But um, when it comes to designing rods, too, a lot of people, like in their mind, they think how that process works. And, and, and for the most part, I would think everyone has a basic understanding of how a rod design project works. But it takes a lot of time, let me tell you. It oh. really, truly does. Oh, it just doesn't like pop out and it's done in two or three months. I mean, some of these projects take a full year and some projects can take up to two years based on what you're trying to do within a series. Absolutely. And I mean, that works with fly rods as well. I mean, look at the manufacturer. Yeah, same like, thing. Every, every couple yeah. of years they're, they're spitting out a, a new a new rod, right? And I mean, you look at a company like yeah. Sage and I'm sure Sage has already got... 2020 stuff just sitting in the vault, right? So, or t sorry, yeah, 2022. And is, 2020 yeah, stuff. and Sage is a great rod company. Yeah. Uh, you know, they make great products as well. And it's the same process, you know. Um, you, you just, you develop a target. And once you achieve the target on the deflection board, then comes in the testing of mm -hmm. the product. Mm -hmm. And once you've tested and you've gotten feedback, um, one of the things that I do is I have put together focus groups around the country and I'll provide them with a sample and I'll say, okay, go fish it. Give me the pros, the cons, what you liked, what you didn't like. And by doing that, it's, it really helps because you get a lot of great feedback and then you can trace back a common denominator of, okay, so this guy said the same thing as this guy or gal, right? Yeah. And then, and then that's how you develop a great product, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Taking the constructive criticism or, or the proper feedback back and uh, tweaking. Absolutely. It. If everyone's saying the same thing, you know, hey, the rod's extremely heavy, you kind of got an issue. Right. Do you know what I mean? So and yes, that's It really, really truly is. is. Oh, yeah. And and if all, and uh, you know, I'll toot my own horn if you don't mind. Yeah, um, go ahead. One of the things that I said immediately, if you look at the rod projects I've been involved with, tip heaviness 
is a problem across the board with many rods uh, around the world, actually. And, um, you know, there's been several different innovative things that Lama Glass has done, obviously a proprietary uh, deal of, of how we conquer and solve this, um, is tip heaviness. And uh, you can't have a tip-heavy rod because if you have a tip-heavy rod, what happens at the end of the day is you have uh, fatigue, rod fatigue. So it takes a lot of work, a lot of work. Definitely. So. definitely. Well, we uh, we definitely wish you well in that journey, and uh, can't wait to see yeah. can't wait to see some fly rods coming up from that company. So thanks for the the yeah. little heads up. Well, I'll, I'll say one last yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you a nugget. Uh, we do have four piece fly rods coming. Four piece. Nice. What, so what weights? I'll just give you that. Uh, all weights, <laughs> all weights, all the way Perfect. up to a 10 weight. All right. Just trying to get, right trying to get more yeah. nuggets. Um, mm-hmm. no, that's good. Hey, Roger, let's circle back to the, to the actual, um, steelhead manifesto, right? And, and, sure. and what you, so you started off writing blogs and then you, you mentioned the, the process of, uh, going online and with, through, you know, due to your kids and helping you on that. Like, what was your concept? Like when you sat there and said, Oh, I just want to write blogs about steelhead. Like what would like, Walk us through, like, why would you, what, like, why would you want to do that? What made you want to do that and take it to the level that you're at where you've built up uh, an extensive audience? I mean, combined between all your, your projects and everything else. I mean, you have almost a hundred thousand people involved. Um, you, mm-hmm. you know, you've done quite a bit. Uh, the, st- it, the brand's been around, when I say brand, like the blog itself and the, the steelhead manifesto. I mean, so many people are aware of that. Like, did you ever see it getting this big? Is that your vision? Is that where you wanted to take this project? Like, or did you just want to write about steelhead? Like walk me through this. Well, you know, I tell you, uh, (laughs) it's kind of, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. I never expected this thing to grow like it did. Um, what I thought was amazing, um, when I started my first blog, um, which unfortunately some of that old blogging material, is gone. We I had over 600 posts that I lost due to a technical glitch, and obviously me not knowing uh, to have the proper things to back all that stuff up. And uh, you know, I just started the, the new web page. But um, what was amazing to me is, uh, you know, I just was a Michigan guy, right? This that loved the outdoors, and I couldn't believe how many people from around the world were reaching out, asking questions. They wanted to know this. Can you write about this? Can you write about that? And um, I, I just thought it was amazing how this technology brought so many people together. And from there, um, I had started the meme page. And for your audience, in case they didn't know, I've written personally over 4,000 different fishing memes. And I didn't realize how powerful that was until I saw the audience grow. And in my work, uh, there's lots of my work on people's T-shirts and Mm. bumper stickers and decals all around the world. And there's nothing I can do about that unless I want to, like, go through the hassle of copywriting, all that stuff. And, you know, it's just not conducive for a meme. But when I started writing the memes and I saw the, the meme page blow up, then I had started the uh, fishing forum page. And then, then I really saw how the, many people wanted to learn how to catch steelhead or get uh, better at angling for them because they truly are a magnificent fish and they can be very challenging at times to catch. Right. And absolutely. <laughs> Totally agree. With and that. that's kind of, that was kind of the thought process behind it. And it just kept growing and it's still growing today. So, so with all this growth, where are you, where do you want to take it now? Like what's the next level for you guys? Well, I, to be honest, um, it, it's gotten so big. I've had to have some moderators help me because, you know, I, there's just no way I could handle mm-hmm the three pages with all the followings. And then on Instagram, (laughs) excuse me, what's great about Instagram was Instagram is mainly photos and some videos, right? It's not all of that extra stuff that you get, let's say with Facebook or on Twitter or 
the other social media platforms. And um, then what had happened was anglers around the world just started hashtagging me in their photos. And I'm like, and mind you, uh, with all due respect to some people, I mean, some photos I can't even post because they're just awful. But there's some photos that are just so incredible that there's no way that we're not going to share that with the world. I mean, you get a magnificent fish and a beautiful photo that shows the colors and uh, maybe the scenery and the joy that it brought that angler. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. So on a daily basis, I'm getting hashtag with photos from around the world and I share them with everybody. Why not? You might as well. I mean, that's like you say, that's part of, uh, you know, growing. And that's the thing that's cool about social, right? Bringing people together and sharing that. And I'm sure on the, on the other side of it, like the person's like, Hey man, I was on the, uh, on the Steelhead Manifesto page. Like, that's my fish. That's me. Like, oh, what an awesome experience. So, for sure. Yeah, it gives people a platform just to share uh, the experience and the fish. And, uh, you know, um, it, it's 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 really, truly something that's special. I, I just had no idea that it was going to grow into this. And like I said before, I, I, I'm truly blessed. And I appreciate everyone's uh, input and support for sure. No, I love how honest you are about that for sure, Roger. Um, you know, yeah. let's look at what. So, going forward, is there anything that you want to do um, that you want to accomplish using that platform? Like, is it uh, growth or is there hosting trips? Or is there like walk like <coughs> like what's what's your plan? Well, to be honest with you, I mean, I don't know if you know about the seminar piece. Um, I do a lot of seminars in the country. As a matter of fact, um, somebody, well, several people have told me, and I guess, I don't know if it's true or not, but it kind of seems like I do a lot of seminars and folks have said that I do a, a lot of seminars across the country, uh, more than typical anglers do. So I really enjoy that aspect of it. Um, getting, to, you know, flying out to different places and cities. And a lot of times I try to schedule a trip while I'm there to experience that fishery and what it has to offer. But I really enjoy growing that piece of it, meeting all the anglers around the country. Cause at the end of the day, I mean, most anglers are pretty good people, right? They're just good people, and we all have that one common bond, and that's the fishery, the fish and the outdoors. And I try to promote uh, my theories. I try to promote, um, uh, when I say theories, not just how to catch them, but catch and release. I'm a huge catch and release guy. Uh, the o I'll, I'll be honest. The only fish I keep is a walleye or a perch, and those things get deep fried. <laughs> I just think God made them for that. But, you know, trout and salmon and steelhead, I, I, I release those fish. So I promote uh, catch and release. And another thing that I promote uh, that I'm involved with this year, we didn't have it, but I uh, do some river cleanup projects. And I would like to take the time on your platform yeah. to encourage any of your listeners out there, no matter where you're at, right? Whether they're in British Columbia or they're in Washington or Oregon or out here in the Great Lakes or Steelhead Alley or Pennsylvania or New York, if you've got a local stream, you know, all you have to do is make a post on your social media page and say, hey, we're going to do a stream cleanup uh, on this day at this time. Can we get some people to give back? Right. And it's amazing. Uh, I've worked on one on the Manistee river here in Michigan, which gets the most angling pressure out of any river system uh, here in the great lakes. And typically we have, I think the lowest year we had 58 volunteers and then our biggest year was over a hundred. Um, so we usually average at least 60, uh, but we usually have 70 or 80 folks on average every year that show up, they bring their families, they bring their children. And uh, those are the types of things that I'd like to see encourage other people uh, to keep doing and, uh, and just to give back. You know, 
yeah, just to give back. Oh, I, and then, I do know. I do know. I do agree. I think yeah, you know. and then the last thing I would say as far as a goal of mine is, uh, you know, I write for some, some magazines, and I've been working on a book. It's not done yet, um, but I'd like to get my first book published and then maybe do some more writing there. And then uh, maybe just retire after that and go fishing, to be honest. You know, it's not a bad plan, my friend. Not a bad plan. Yeah, well, all this traveling, you know, and stuff, it, it's great. But at the end of the day, it does cut into your fishing time. And so once I do slow down eventually, I'd like to just do some more fishing. How's that sound for a plan? I, I, you know what? Something we can all get behind for sure. So, Roger, yeah, uh, it's funny you mentioned in there, and my, my, my ears or my eyes just like lit up. You mentioned something called the Steelhead Alley. Tell me about a Steelhead Alley. Yeah, well, I got to tell you, if your listeners aren't familiar with the Great Lakes region as a whole, uh, it is home to the world's largest steelhead population on planet Earth. Um, on average, uh, all the Great Lakes states um, that surround the Great Lakes, the uh, Department of Natural Resources stocks 5.2 million steelhead. Um Yes, and that does not uh, include the natural reproduction that's going on. There's some really cool stuff that's going on. We always knew that there was some natural reproduction mm -hmm. going on, but we thought that there wasn't a lot in a lot of different streams. And then the Salmon Ambassador Program that they had implemented exposed a lot of data to where we found that there was a lot more uh, natural reproduction on the salmon than we thought. And so now they're switching that program over to steelhead here in Michigan. And they're going to study uh, how much natural reproduction, or at least get an idea of how much is actually going on. So with all of that being said, the Great Lakes region and Steelhead Alley is a tremendous destination. If you're interested in catching a steelhead, uh, this is the place to come for sure. And what now, in Steelhead Alley, you know, the fish, for example, might be smaller, mm -hmm. right, than let's say British Columbia, right? Um, you guys have the, the natural fish, you know, the ocean run fish that can, they can exceed 20 pounds, you know. Um, but for sheer numbers and enjoyment and a great day out on the stream, Steelhead Alley is just amazing. So. You can go all the way across the state of Ohio and into Pennsylvania and just just have a, a ball. You know, there's just lots of fish to be had. I love that, man. I just like, you know, and the, just the two different coasts, like we're on the west, you're on the east. And it's just, yeah, I, I just love that how you're talking about it. And I mean, in the returns and the numbers and, and just the natural reproduction, like it sounds like everything's going on really well with uh, what's what your state and what the states are doing, managing that. So, um, and that's a key, that's a key point. Uh, management is so important when it comes to, to wildlife, whether it's wildlife or the fishery, um, you know, our natural resources is really what I'm saying is as a whole, all the way around, it's got to be managed correctly. And it also has to be managed, not just with our government agencies uh, through laws and policy, but we also have to have that common denominator with the angling public, right? And in cooperation, you can't you can't go fishing and throw a six pack of beer uh, you cans in the river. I mean, oh, that just is not good, right? That just comes so, down to angler management or self self management managing yourself. Yes, you know what I mean, if you and that's yeah. yeah, and I bring that up because that's a part where I hope with social media and as I travel around and meet people or I do my writings that I can convey that message that might uh, affect other people's way of thinking on everything. And, uh, you know, especially on the catch and release side, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't listen. I'm not that guy that says you're going to burn in hell. If you catch a hatchery fish, you bought your license and the law says you can do that. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes if you just let it go, you know, uh, to let somebody else catch it or, you know, I've actually caught the same fish twice before, you know, why not? 
You know, yeah. it's a gift that keeps on giving, you yeah. know? Yeah, you know, we're I'm like that with my trout. Um, I rare, rarely, rarely, rarely keep fish. Um, we just did a, I just did a trip mm-hmm. with my 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 boys, and they both got a fish, and they 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 expressed an interest that they wanted to clean a fish, or in their words, they wanted to take the guts out. So when we did, we did keep two fish this year. I'm like, out of all the times I've been fishing for trout, which mm-hmm. is you know three times, yeah. two two to three times a week, every one of those fish were at go, and we kept two fish. Do you know what I mean? It's it's mm-hmm. a, you know. It's not. Yeah. It's not about how much people do or, or what you know. And we're not about to say you know what's right or wrong either. You bought your license, yes, you you can do that. But you know, we one of the fish that we unfortunately had, uh, you know, eggs in it, right? So it's just yeah, stuff like that. that we were like, oh, that's too bad, right? We didn't we didn't know at the time. So, um, yeah, no question. I mean, you know, uh, there's plenty of fish, and and you know, how many do you really need to eat, right? So if you're eating a couple fish, that's fine, as long as they're being utilized and, um, you know, stuff like that. But uh, I just, I'm a big proponent of catch and release. And like I said, man, if you want some fish for the frying pan, it's tough to beat those uh, walleye and perch. I mean, those things are just delicious. Couldn't, couldn't <laughs> agree more. Couldn't agree more of those. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, we I think we have like a small area out here in BC where there's walleye, like a tiny, tiny, like on the Columbia River. So, mm-hmm. but uh, other than mm-hmm. that, like we just don't get them. So I'm, now you're making me hungry. Roger, let's, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's quickly talk about like what what's your what's your go-to so you're you're on steelhead alley you're in the you're on the east coast here what's your go-to like how are you how are you going to catch these fish how are you going to pull these these guys up walk me through like in case anyone's well going, hey i, I want to try this yeah so you know the first thing i'd recommend to everybody is you know find your local fly shop um they generally offer classes you know, like I had mentioned, I want to learn how to spay cast. So why not go to some dudes that really know how to do that? You know, I'm not too proud. This is a lifelong journey, right? We're all going to keep learning until we die. Uh, you're never going to know everything. But one of the things I think what I rather what I would do is maybe spend some time just to share with your listeners on what I do to um, catch fish, right? And so the first thing that I would do is when you walk up to a run, and when I say this, I mean, we're talking about the walking and waiting angler, you know, like in Steelhead Alley, right? Most of the guys are walking and waiting. Um, The first thing that I would do would be to stop and study the water, slow your roll, and look at the run. Uh, and study the water uh, before you jump in and start making your blind cast because one of the reasons why you should do that is sometimes, depending on the time of year and the water temperature, those fish are going to give themselves away of their location because when there's lots of fish in, you know, um, you know, let's say in the fall or in the winter, uh, you know, not just the spring run, when these fish come in, they're jockeying for a position in that pool, in that run, where they're going to hold. Mm-hmm. And um, as they're jockeying around and moving around, you might see that silver flash, right? That's going to tell you where the fish are. And why that's important is, man, I mean, I've been in my drift boat or my jet sled going down the river, and I'll see an angler, and he's standing just off the bank, he's standing where the fish are holding currently, (laughs) you know? And so maybe if somebody just stopped for a moment and kind of studied that water before they go in and and cast, um, you know, that's going to give you uh, a lot of insight of how to fish that. And then you want to position yourself in the run. So, uh, you know, it's presented down and across. Right. And, um, you know, a lot of our rivers, too, aren't the size of rivers like you have out on the West Coast, right? A lot of our um, rivers are much smaller. Um, and so, you know, it, it, we can do this, right, uh, to where you have a larger river system. They could be further and further out, and you've got to wait out there to get to them. So, 
But, um, you know, once you cast out, you know, throw an upstream mend in your line. And I think a lot of people um, that are just starting out uh, don't know how important mending your line is. Um, this will allow uh, the fly to sink faster in the water column and just do upstream mends, right? And what's great is by doing this, I think it slows the fly down in the presentation and it actually makes the fly hunt for you within the run. So that's kind of my opinion uh, on, on that is just, you know, look at the run, analyze it and think about, Hey, if I was a steelhead based on this water temperature and time of year, where would I, um, you know, uh, want to be holding and, you know, just position yourself. You can always start higher and then work your way down. Right. Yeah. So is that what, is that um, what most people, I I know that's what I do. I, I start higher and work down. And yes, absolutely. And the, another thing I forgot to mention, um, you know, concerning the mending is when, when you're, when you're fishing for these fish, if the fish happen to be kind of holding higher, maybe in a pool or something, you don't want to mend too much because, uh, you know, you want that fly to sink just to where they're at, right? Mm -hmm. But typically, going deep is the way to go because steelhead, in my opinion, are typically 8 to 10 inches off the bottom most of the time, regardless mm -hmm. of where they're at uh, at that time of year, you know. So mending is important, and your, your um, position on how you start to fish that run, you know, I just was trying to make the point that, you know, slow your roll, stop for a minute, kind of look at things before you just walk in because you could be walking in right on the fish. Yeah, right. It's, it's amazing. And it's funny. The more people I talk to about steelhead, the more I fish it, you know, how many fish are so close to like, like, like right on the bank, essentially. They're just right yeah. there. And you look down at your feet and yeah. you're seeing them swim right by. And meanwhile, most people are casting right in the middle. It's uh, yeah, yeah, and it's so important. I mean, so as people are listening, if they're looking for some nuggets, mm -hmm. you know, I would I would give them that advice. Uh, another thing that I would um, recommend to folks if they're just getting into uh, fly fishing for steelhead is if you're swinging flies, you know, let that fly swing through the run, let that line straighten out. Right, you always have to assume that that steelhead is following it, right? You've got to assume that. And then it's not till the fly slows down or it actually pauses that you get that bit. And we typically call that the hang or the dangle. I don't know. Do you guys call that something yeah, different yeah, no, out there? Or? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I got to tell you, um, some people think I'm crazy, but I say there's no set time to let that fly hang down there. Right. Um, I would say, you know, 20 seconds, 40 seconds. I mean, there's been times that fly has been hanging there for a minute and then I get bit. Right. Yeah. So I guess the, the bottom line is, you know, you can't get impatient on that dangle. So let that fly swing through the run, get down there and let it hang and uh, let that fish eat it. You know, just you can't get impatient, you know. Absolutely. No, I, it's all good advice. Definitely. So, you know what? Lots yeah. going on, Roger. Um, I mean, you guys are you guys are killing it. We we're so happy for everything you've done. I know as a community uh, and everything like that. The blogs, the knowledge you have, and I definitely know that you were supposed to be out here in BC. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID and, and our border closures and everything, that didn't materialize. And I know you're trying to get out here. So, you know, we. I will tell you. I, I, no, I'm going to make you a promise. Yeah, you better that. And next year, man, I'm coming. I'm coming to British Columbia. Come hell or high water, I've got to go there. It's one beautiful place for sure. And uh, you're truly blessed. You know, I'm blessed. I've got a great fishery here in the Great Lakes, and we catch lots of fish. Mm -hmm. But there's no question those ocean run steelhead and that setting out there is amazing. And I'm truly jealous. <laughs> well, 
once this is all done and, and three, we'll definitely uh, we'll have to extend an invite to you. I know we're we're trying to put together these steelhead camps and get some uh, qualified good. I don't know if qualified, yeah. are, just quality instructors, guys that know what they're doing, guys that are you know that have a wealth of knowledge that can pass that and share that along. So I'll uh, yeah I'll talk to you guys about that when that comes further down the road. So um, okay, great, yeah, definitely love to De- definitely. Roger, any last words for the listeners? Uh, you know, I, first I would just like to say again, thank you for having me on, um, for anybody out there that listened to the podcast, I, I appreciate their time and listen to me ramble. And if they want to find me, they can email me at steelheadmanifesto at gmail.com. My website is steelheadmanifesto.com. And then obviously on Instagram or on Facebook, it's Steelhead Manifesto. So thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Yeah, you bet, Roger, for sure. I'm going to make sure I put all those details within the show notes. And uh, listeners, I want to thank you guys. And Roger, definitely thank you so much for everything. So, all right, guys. Thank you. No worries. Take care. You've been listening to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. If you like this podcast episode, please let us know. Leave a review and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast listening platform.